Good evening and uh, welcome to another Tuesday night lecture run by us here at the Mid Ulster Amateur Radio Club. Uh, we're really uh, glad that you're with us and if you're checking us on our YouTube channel, please do feel free to hit that like and subscribe button. Uh, this evening uh, we have Don, uh, Golf 3 XA Tango Tango. He's going to be talking to us about uh, CDCC or CDX and everything else there and um, it's going to be a good one. So um, Don, if you want to uh, unmute yourself there, uh, tell us a wee bit about yourself, uh, an interesting fact uh, and then we'll hand straight over to you there. Well, thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you for inviting me to Mid Ulster. I, I, I'm rather fed up with Zooms, I have to say, but uh, th there's no way I would be giving a talk to Mid Ulster if it was uh, anywhere other than Zoom. So I guess that that's an advantage. Uh, so it's nice to see everybody. Nice to see Steve on there. I I didn't recognise you with all the facial hair, but I guess that's what happens during lockdown. Um, Right, yes, so I've been licensed, uh, oh, well over 50 years. I've been an RSGB member for over 50 years, got to mention that. And um, <laughs> uh, started in 68 with a, with a code R85 on 160 and 80. I went straight for the Class A license and uh, have been active ever since. You know, um, it dropped a bit when I was first married, obviously, and that sort of thing, but... Uh, never actually stopped playing radio, uh, played on 160 right through to 23 SEMS at one time or another, and uh, very interested right from the start in both DXing and contesting, and they're the things that continue to interest me. Um, I worked for BT for about 30 years and then left and, and did a number of voluntary things for the society. For um, I chaired uh, various committees, I, uh, I was on the board, I wrote for umpteen different magazines over the years, Amateur Radio Magazine, Ham Radio Today, uh, Radcom, and then I got the job as editor of Practical Wireless about seven and a half years ago, and that is now what keeps me uh, pretty much occupied, so, uh, and keeps me interested in, of course, in all aspects of the hobby, because uh, I need to follow all aspects to, to cover them in the magazine. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, that probably just about uh, sums up <laughs> without giving you the hour or the 24 hours or whatever, Dave. Well, it's completely uh, over to yourself now. Um, so uh, whenever you're ready with uh, your presentation, feel free. If I'm really clever, uh, I can share. Is that working? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Let me just see if I can get back to. Um, uh, right. Um, oh, that's better. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I <laughs> you got it all. You got it. I, I didn't. Right. Um, you were given. I was given the brief to talk about CDXC and DXing and so on. Uh, I've interpreted it fairly liberally. I hope you'll find this of interest. Um, well, let's see how it goes anyway. I wanted to start by talking about CDXC and how it started because it was created back in 1981 uh, for sharing DX information along the Thames Valley, uh, hence the name or what used to be the name, the Chiltern DX Club. Uh, and membership was strictly limited to those within range on 144525 because that frequency was used for passing DX information oh, do you know what's on 20 meters at the moment, and so on. And um, it published a regular newsletter right from the start, although it was very thin compared with the current digest. It, it's always held social events, and it hosted visiting amateurs. And uh, just to uh, illustrate a couple, one is the late uh, Ray G3NOM in, in a top uh, picture, uh, handing over a t-shirt to uh, Roger G3KMA on the left and sitting down is Alan G3PMR who is now 5B4AHJ and has been for a number of years. Uh, so um, th the reason Ray was a visiting amateur is that uh, he, he's married to a, a Thai lady and was living in Thailand now having worked most of his life in Southeast Asia. And in the bottom picture 
uh, a very young G3 KMA on the right, handing a plaque to Father Moran, or the late Father Moran, nine in one MM. So that was a real classic meeting. I attended some of those, although I couldn't belong to CDXC at the time because I wasn't within 525 range. I was living up in Cambridge. So um, other things that they did, an annual dinner and an AGM, but uh, that also got involved, for example, in hosting uh, visiting amateurs, so not, not just visiting amateurs, but amateurs passing through. And, and by that, uh, here's an example, team members who were en route to the South Atlantic uh, from all over the world, um, WA4 JQS, as you can see in the bottom picture with the, the flag being given to him by Martin G3ZAY, uh, and a bunch of other UK amateurs, but some, uh, uh, sorry, a bu bunch of other US amateurs, I should say, but some from elsewhere. They all met in the UK and uh, stay, were hosted overnight by CDXC members. And then we took them to Bryce Norton and saw them safely on their way to the Falklands. And, and from there, I guess, by ship to the South Sandwich Islands where they were headed. Uh, and we did that um, a couple of times. There was the 3Y0 PI, um, Peter the First Island uh, group, the first um, group to go there that we hosted as well. Um, over the years, we've also been heavily involved in, in helping to organize or, or, or to support the RSGB convention. And to give you an idea of the date of these photographs, my son, who is helping G3 KMA collect money in that first photograph, uh, is, now, um, is now 37, sorry, 38, I should say. Uh, so uh, that was a few years ago. And on the right in the picture, uh, there's the late G4FAM, uh, Ron GW3YDX, and Dennis G3MXJ, or as he uh, is these days, F5VHY. So uh, it certainly brings back some memories for me. But the role of CDXC has changed over the years. Uh, as I said, it uh, started life as an alerting group on 144525. Um, aimed at helping members achieve honour roll. Indeed, as I will tell you, they had to be pretty close before they could even join. Pretty close to honour roll, that is. Um, we established the first packet cluster in the UK, G, uh, G4LJF. He and, um, went to the States. So he was a pilot with British Airways, so uh, he was regularly in the States, in fact, and brought back uh, the software and established GB7DXI. And that uh, made a big change because we didn't need 525 anymore, of course. And then once Packet Cluster was networked, it allowed CDXC to grow and become a nationwide group while still retaining its early aims of, of sharing DX information. But these days it's much more focused on the expedition support, although obviously in 2020 we didn't do too much of that uh, for the simple reason that there weren't many D expeditions. And sharing of news and views, um, both within the club and, and more broadly, I mean, we get involved with the RSGB Spectrum Forum and, and other bodies that are interested in, in HF activity and, and HF allocations and so on. And generally representing DXs and contesters in the UK and internationally. Um, on the right, uh, you can see our Facebook page so we've really moved into the, the 21st century, although I gather uh, Facebook is a bit passe these days and uh, we should probably be on Instagram or something, but whatever. Um, you know, there, there have been times when members or thought that the end was nigh. Uh, as I said, it started as a members on to honor roll and to join. In the early days, the entry qualification was a country score of 280. I think it was 280, I put it in brackets. Um, that was later reduced to 250. Oh my God, you know, they'll let anybody in. And then to 200 countries and, and even down to 100. And indeed today, as long as you uh, have bona fide interest in, in DXing and contesting or, and or contesting, um, you're very welcome to join. We don't ask you to prove anything. We don't ask you to have a supporter who, who can testify that you've worked 250 countries or whatever. 
And as I said, we moved from being a Chiltern-based body to a national body, but we're now international. And, and as I'll tell you later, we, we have quite a, a, a following of, um, of overseas members. Uh, but as I say, for, for some of the members at the time, um, you know, these changes took place. They really thought the end of the world was, uh, was Im imminent. Uh, you can see though on the right, um, one of the, the annual uh, social events or one of the, the annual social events. Uh, this was at our house, um, our previous house, I should say, near, near Reading. And uh, you can see some of the members gathered there, uh, some raffle prizes or t-shirts or something on the table there. And a lot of fun being had by all. So the current focus uh, is the digest, both in paper and electronic form. Electronic helps us with uh, overseas members. There are some members who'd like to see only an electronic digest so that there's money available, even more money available for supporting expeditions. Um, I'm not in favour of that. Um, you know, the support of expeditions is important, but it's not our be all and end all. And if people want a paper digest, then I feel they should be able to get one. Um, there's an email list for members so that they can you know, chat to each other via email and share. <clears throat> As I, I've mentioned Facebook, we also have Twitter. And recently we've been playing with Skype and we've got two groups on Skype. We've got one that's purely uh, to, um, to exchange spots, in other words, information about a DX station that is active now on a particular frequency <clears throat> and another group for chat because the chat was kind of taking over the spots and, and confusing people. Um, I should say we also have a, a CDXC um, cluster. So, uh, you know, that's a closed cluster for CDXC members. Uh, and can be useful in sharing DX information before it becomes more widely available and, and everybody jumps on the frequency. Uh, we support expeditions and, and that's both major expeditions and IOTA expeditions. For a number of years we, we didn't bother with IOTA, not directly. Uh, what we did was give a, an annual donation to IREF, the, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, uh, international um, islands group. But uh, we do now directly support a, a number of IOTA expeditions. Uh, we run DX challenges, uh, both an annual one and, and then a, a low band one in the spring and a high band one in the autumn. Uh, we give financial support to Clublog because it's just such an amazing tool. It's been created by one of our members, um, Mike or G7VJR. Um, and, and, you know, we couldn't live without it. We have club um, uh, tables you know, uh, for the challenges and for other purposes on club log, but it's such a useful facility for, um, uh, for DXs everywhere. And it would be wrong for us not to support that. We, we are in fact the largest DX foundation in Europe. We have about 750 members. And as I said earlier, uh, quite a number of those are overseas. And on the right, you can see the latest copy of the digest. And on the front is a picture of the, the Russians who were uh, recently in A25 and Charlie 9. And of course, uh, we sponsored them. They're one of the few successful expeditions in, in the last year or so. Uh, they did a fantastic job. And uh, there they are holding our banner. And, and in 2020, because of COVID, we held an online AGM. It uh, actually enabled our whole membership to, to participate in the voting in a, in a way that we can't with having a physical AGM, of course, because uh, not everybody can get to that. So this year we, we made the decision to combine the AGM with an online convention. Uh, and that was very successful. Uh, we had four talks. You can see them illustrated in the, the poster above, the South Orkney, um, the VP8PJ expedition of last year, a talk about propagation by Steve, G0KYA, uh, a talk about Smith charts by G4KNO, and, uh, and a talk by Dave, G3WGN in the, in the top left, 
about building his new contest station. So a real, um, a real variety of talks there. And we had a very good attendance and very good feedback, I have to say. So that was nice. I just wanted to say a little bit about myself in respect of CDXC, just to bore you. I joined in late 1984 after moving to Reading because uh, I was then entitled to join because I was within um, in, in range of 525, of course. And uh, so I've been a member for, what, 37 years. And I've served as treasurer. I've had three spells as digest editor. I've served as chairman and I'm currently the president. And on the right, you can see a visit I made to France a couple of years ago. Uh, no, 2018, gosh, um, three years ago, uh, to uh, present a, a plaque to the other CDXC, to the Clipperton DX Club, on the occasion of their 40th anniversary. And I was very pleased to do that and uh, was made very welcome. Uh, there's no rivalry between us, we're all in the same game. So let me talk a little bit about expeditions, because CDXC members have participated individually or together in the expeditions, but not in the early years, specifically under the auspices of CDXC. There had been some contest efforts that were purely CDXC members, um, both in England um, from G4LJF's place, for example, and to the Channel Islands. Um, I was involved in organising some of those. We went to Jersey, we went to Guernsey. Uh, but with the arrival of Neville G3NUG on the scene after he retired as a, a, a one of the partners in Price Waterhouse, a, a plan was hatched for something more ambitious. Um, Neville was never one to think small. And he wanted us to take on the Americans and others who tended to dominate some de expeditions and thought that there was no reason why the UK couldn't put on something reasonably big. Uh, so our first effort was 9M0C, the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea in 1998. We had 12 operators from, from the UK, from the US, from Japan, and made over 65,000 contacts which we felt wasn't too bad for a first effort because at the time that was the fourth largest expedition ever. And you can see on the left, uh, our 20 meter Yagi. Um, what we had multi-band Yagis uh, for the other bands, uh, an A3S for, for 10, 15 and 20 and an A3WS uh, for 17 and 12. And we actually learned a lesson, which is that there are problems if you use multiband antennas on expeditions because you do get interactions. Uh, in the middle, though, you can see we, we were pretty ambitious on 40. We went for a full size four square and, and that worked gangbusters. Um, very, very good antenna. Uh, we also tried a four square on 80 with reduced size loaded verticals and that didn't work so well. And, and to this day, I don't know why. Um, you can see, though, what we were coping with on the right, uh, that uh, we put up the antennas originally uh, away from where all those ground nesting birds were, but uh, they spread in the course of our expedition. And by the time we had to take the antennas down, we were stepping carefully over uh, dead birds, broken eggs, and God knows what. But the building at the back there was the building we used um, for our shack and uh, indeed for building some of the antennas indoors. It was a large conference room. Uh, the Spratly Islands are, are disputed between Malaysia, the Philippines, China, um, Vietnam, all the countries around. Uh, the Malaysians uh, lay claim to this particular one. And one of the ways that they maintain their claim is by using it for a number of activities, including conferences. Although it has to be said that the main purpose of, um, or the main activity on Spratly is deep sea diving. They get lots of scuba divers coming there. Um, in fact, Don G3BJ or G3OZF as he still was at this time, uh, actually took his diving certificate while he was there. Uh, the downside of that is they don't keep a lot of alcohol on the island because um, divers don't tend to drink. It doesn't go very well with diving but radio amateurs do. And uh, it didn't take as long for us to drink um, the island dry. And that was a slight problem, but there you go. Right, so, I mean, the question was having pulled off the fourth biggest expedition ever, what should we do next? 
Now, 9M0C was promoted as a CDXCD expedition, but we realized afterwards that the financials were very substantial, and, and for anything else we did, they were going to be even more substantial. And they could have brought CDXC to its knees if anything had gone wrong. Um, you know, if, if, if the outgoings were, were committed and the incomings didn't arrive or whatever. So we set up Five Star DX Association, FSDXEA, to manage the de-expeditions at arm's length from CDXC. Uh, some of the members wondered why we'd done that, but that was the reason. It was very simple. And the first de-expedition under our FSDXA banner uh, was D68C from the Comoros in 2001. And very successful it was too. We were at the peak of the sunspot cycle. At one point, we had three stations running on 10 meters simultaneously, uh, one on CW, one on sideband and one on FM. And they were all piling the contacts into the log. We made over 40,000 cues on 10 meters yeah, on that expedition and over 100,000 altogether. We were the first the expedition to do that. Um, we decided, uh, after what I said uh, about multiband antennas, that this time we'd have monoband antennas on all bands, which we did, and multiple stations. So that, for example, at dawn and dusk, where, when all the bands tend to be open from 160 right through to 10 or even 6, um, we could have stations running on every one of those bands, all nine bands. Um, now, we did want to keep the CDXC link and, and all members were expected to join CDXC. And I have to say, Neville did a very good job of that, that if anybody arrived on the island not a member, they certainly didn't leave not a member. Uh, you can see how we got the kit there on the right. So we uh, shipped to Spratly in some wooden crates that we'd had made and, and they, the crates went out on a fishing boat, although we flew out to the island. Um, but here uh, we were able to ship a container and uh, ha having seen the way it was brought ashore in the Comoros um, on that, uh, really on um, wooden poles between two outrigger canoes uh, effectively, I, I wasn't too happy. I mean, they had a crane on the, um, on the shore to lift it ashore and there was a lorry that was able to bring it to the hotel, which is where you see it here. But uh, I do wonder if how easily it could have ended up in the drink. You can see in the top picture some of the kit that we had inside that container. The antennas strung from the roof, boxes of radios and uh, reels of coax and all the rest of it, uh, all the paraphernalia of a large expedition. Uh, I want to say at this point a little bit about FSDXA's philosophy. FSDXA, by the way, no longer exists, unfortunately, but we pulled off uh, some of the major expeditions of all time. And I think it's uh, something that FSDXA and CDXC can justifiably be proud. So it was to focus on a top 50 destination, a uh, top 50 in terms of how needed it was among, uh, among DXs. Um, but not the top few, because they tend to be politically or physically almost impossible. Um, what we had in mind was shifting the heavy kit beforehand by sea, which required a stable political situation because your container could be at sea for, for several weeks. Uh, you didn't want the situation to have changed by the time it got there. Um, and, and similarly with licensing, we wanted it to be straightforward. And we wanted, um, you know, instead of just giving out this rare location, we wanted to be able to give it out on all bands. And I, by that, I mean also the edge bands, 160 and 80, the walk bands, um, six meters if possible. And, and the ones that a smaller expedition, you know, may have put some effort into, but, but could not have done that and everything else as well. Uh, and we wanted to make it available to modestly equipped DX chasers, people with wire antennas and so on. Um, you know, not just the people with the big beams and the linears. Uh, and we wanted it to be an event with pre-publicity, a good website, daily news and log updates, articles afterwards, talks afterwards. Um, and although not for the first one or two, but, but later on we started producing videos as well. So, so 
the whole wrap around to make it something that, that DXs around the world could really feel a part of and, and enjoy both beforehand, during and afterwards. I have to say, you know, with the scale of this, we could only do one every three years because there's a, a year or so of preparation, there's the expedition, there's several months, if not a year or so of QSLing and writing articles and doing talks and all the rest of it. So it was not until three years later, 2004, that we went to Rodrigues. Uh, this is an island that belongs to Mauritius, but is far enough away that it counts separately for the DXCC awards. And, and we had more innovation for this one. Um, we had a stack for six meters. We had gear for 70 SEMS EME. A star log, which was our logging software written by John V3WGV. Um, was enhanced to support the WPX contest so that we could run that simultaneously with continuing to run on CW on the other on the non contest bands uh, and yet have one integrated log very clever stuff and, and John managed that and we made 153,000 QSOs uh, including nearly 1500 on six meters and, and over 5000 on RITI which I think at the time was a RITI record al although it's been beaten since then. Uh, you can see some of the team members in that photo. So, you know, bit, again, a big team. And uh, here's the, the six meter stack. In the top right, you can see the two element 30 meter Yagi being assembled. And in the bottom right, you can see some of the antennas. They don't show up that well, but you can see some of them around um, the hotel grounds. Uh, so we certainly went to town on that one and uh, had a lot of fun, I have to say. But uh, in 2007, we tried something completely different. Another island, believe it or not, that belongs to Mauritius, it's about halfway between Mauritius and the Seychelles, St. Brandon. Again, it counts separately for DXCC, but this time we were going to an uninhabited island, no hotel. Um, it's 24 hour sea crossing from Mauritius. We had to, uh, had to go from Mauritius, a, a Polish group had tried to get there from um, the Seychelles and been told on no uncertain terms that they had to clear customs and, and immigration in Mauritius before they could go to, uh, to St. Brandon. Um, there were no sunspots while we were there, but uh, as I'll show you, we, we did quite well. We were four weeks there and, and where in previous expeditions we, we'd had a, a changeover of some team members after two weeks, people who couldn't do a full four weeks, um, they'd gone out and others had come in to replace them. On this occasion, because we were there by boat, and there was really nothing to, uh, to it, but uh, everybody to commit to the whole four weeks. Uh, 20 team members, and we made 137,000 queues, which was less than 3B9. But as I said, no sunspots and indeed uh, nothing on six meters, unfortunately. Uh, we had to live in tents. You can see some of them uh, at the top there. There were two buildings on the island which uh, were used normally in the season, in the fishing season for hosting deep sea fishermen. Um, but we use them as our shacks. In fact, I'll, I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, you can see some of the antennas top right. And bottom left, we had to take our own power and we took six the diesel generators, Chinese made, of course, and the locals. And when I say the locals, um, there were local people on the island, uh, both ones that, that our fixer in, in Mauritius had organized for us to be there and to take care of us and to cook for us and so on. And also some passing fishermen who, who stay overnight on the island and, um, and um, they had created the, this hut for us to put the generators in, which was very useful, except uh, <laughs> that the, the fumes got a little bit uh, thick in there. Now, the power was taken care of, incidentally, by Ivan G3IZD, uh, whose um, full-time job when he'd been working was looking after the nuclear power plant uh, on Polaris submarines. He was a submariner. So uh, this was a bit of a come down, but uh, he did a sterling job. You can see Neville in that middle picture uh, with some of the, the locals and, and the bottom right is the boat that took us uh, on a rather hairy 24 hour sea crossing to St. Brandon. <clears throat> so this is in one of the buildings and I wanted to show you this because 
this typified our large expeditions. Uh, the, the operating room looked more like a call center. Um, can we take your call? Yes, we'll fulfill that with the five and nine, and we will therefore put you in the log. Um, this was clearly during the daytime when not too many bands were open. Uh, at dawn and dusk, every one of those operating positions would be manned, and, and each one, as you can see, had a, uh, on that occasion, an FT2000 transceiver, a quadrilinear amplifier, uh, the computer for logging. But our final expedition in 2011, oh gosh, 10 years ago now, um, turned out to be something a little bit uh, different. Uh, that was T32C on Christmas Island. And, and let me just explain, there are two Christmas Islands. One of them belongs to Australia and is in the Indian Ocean. But this one is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, three hours south of Hawaii. And uh, I think about a similar number of hours north of Fiji. And we shipped a container and it got as far as Fiji, but unfortunately, uh, because Fiji incidentally is, is on the regular um, route for, for container ships, but uh, the ships we were relying on to get it from Fiji to Christmas Island, one of them I think broke down, another one there was another problem with, and it was quite clear that our kit was not going to arrive. We'd wanted for a number of years to go to Christmas Island. We wanted to do a Pacific expedition rather than an Indian Ocean one, uh, because one of our focuses was to try and uh, do a good job to Europe. And too many of the Pacific expeditions were run by Americans and they were happy if they worked a bunch of Americans and, and really didn't focus on Europe, which is something we wanted to do. Uh, so we were faced with a challenge. <clears throat> Do we call the whole thing off? Well, a lot of people had booked flights, a lot of people had booked holiday. Uh, so we looked at how we could put together a hand-carried expedition with 16 complete stations, and we managed it. And you can see some of the FT-450s <clears throat> in the bottom left picture that uh, Yesu lent us. <clears throat> and those proved to be very good radios. They actually proved to be better than the FT2000s we'd had in 3B7. Uh, the only problem was that they don't have a separate receive output. Um, so uh, it was a bit of a challenge on the 160 and 80 meter bands where we want to use um, beverages and loops and so on for receiving. Uh, we also managed to get our hands on a bunch of linear amplifiers of, of different shapes and sizes. And for antennas, we, we took a lot of fiberglass poles um, to make uh, simple verticals or, or vertical dipole arrays. And uh, we would have them on the beach, so they would work pretty well, and indeed they did. Because we turned out we were the first, and, and indeed to date the only expedition to have made more than 200,000 contacts. And, and we made 59,000 of those with Europe which we thought was, uh, was not bad going. Um, so that expedition still holds a, a whole bunch of records uh, for individual bands, individual modes and so on. And uh, we, we felt uh, that was pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, we, we were not able to run a subsequent one. Um, Neville became ill and, and one thing and another, it just didn't happen. But, uh, uh, and some of us indeed decided that um, three years between expeditions was too long, we were getting too old. Uh, so uh, you'll have heard of the six Gs, um, all incidentally also CDXC members. And, and we've pulled off uh, a number of expeditions, at least up until uh, COVID put the, the, the kibosh on it. So one of the other, well, indeed, one of the major activities of CDXC these days, as I said, is the expedition sponsorship. And uh, the, there's a list on the right here of some of the expeditions we, we've sponsored um, in recent years. By no means comprehensive, but it shows some of the larger um, sums we, we've paid out uh, to, uh, you know, to major expeditions. You have to realize that some of these are very costly indeed. And um, you know, even a few thousand dollars may not make a big dent, but if enough expedition um, sponsors come forward, th then it all helps. 
Uh, and indeed, as I said earlier, we, we have sponsored a number of IOTA efforts. These tend to be by local people and generally not people flying halfway around the world. But often, uh, for example, in the, um, uh, the Indonesian islands, for example, uh, by local Indonesians who don't have a lot of money of their own, uh, but they do have lots of enthusiasm and, and we can encourage them by, by making a modest donation to their operation. But this is quite impressive actually, and, and I hadn't realized uh, until I saw this uh, data recently, but uh, to date we've paid out almost $70,000 in expedition sponsorship over the years. And uh, I'm very proud of that, that that's quite something. Because if we look at uh, what the expeditions cost, well, let's just look at the team costs only, um, not the travel to the setup point, just the team costs. Uh, E6GG, that was the 6G's effort in 2015 and, and was funded, I, I have to say, entirely by team members. They didn't ask for donations, cost about 12K. Um, between six of them, that was 2K ahead. Uh, and that's in addition to getting to Niue, which is where the expedition is, uh, or at least as far as New Zealand, which was the setting up point, if you like. Um, K1N, Navassa expedition in 2015, uh, 300K. Now, why was that so expensive when it's just offshore um, the States in the Caribbean? Well, very simply because Navassa is uh, protected uh, by the United States um, there's a number of issues around it. Um, it's used for drug running, I believe, by South Americans, but it's also uh, has ecological um, concerns and so on. So it was uh, dictated that the team had to fly everything in by helicopter and, and out again and, and indeed not leave anything on the island. And that's why that one proved expensive. VP8PJ last year um, was in the uh, South Orkneys. And when you go to somewhere like the South Orkneys, which are a long way south and pretty remote, you need a reliable boat and uh, you need all the kits because there have been some tales of expeditions in the past who've taken tents that were too flimsy and, and so on, and they've ended up at each other's throats uh, almost um, because uh, you know, they want to blame somebody for the fact that it's all going pear-shaped. Well, this team didn't do that. They did it properly, but of course it costs. And um, they did a very good job too. They used the Braveheart, which is a, a well-known, very reliable boat, well used to the expeditions and well used to these parts of the world. Uh, 3Y0Z, which didn't happen, unfortunately, to Bouvet Island in 2018, was going to cost more than half a million dollars. Um, they had needed a helicopter on the ship um, for emergency, possible emergency evacuation <clears throat> and so on. And it didn't even get there because there were mechanical problems with the ship and the weather closed in and, and they got to within sight of the island. It must have been deeply frustrating uh, because the captain uh, made the call and said they had to turn back. Um, yeah, what can I say? There's a group trying to go there, um, not next year, but the year after. Uh, we'll have to see what happens. So where does the money come from for these expeditions? Well, just excuse me a moment. It comes obviously from team member contributions and they, that tends to be the major element. <clears throat> it comes from sponsorship. Um, sometimes that's by way of equipment loan by, by the manufacturers, um, antennas. Uh, logistics even, and QSL card printing. Sometimes local tourism organizations will help out. And donations with QSL cards. DX foundations, that's where we come in, and obviously individual donations. I have to say QSL card donations have obviously dropped significantly since Logbook of the World came along. There was an interesting discussion on the CDXC reflector today because the I just mentioned the, the, the Bouvet expedition for two years time. They've just announced that uh, if you want a physical QSL card direct, it will cost $20. And there was an outcry by some of the people on our reflector 
Um, but there was similarly a, a, an opposing outcry saying, well, $20 when you've spent thousands of dollar, dollars or pounds on your antennas and radio and so on. And these days you don't pay for most QSL cards because you just uh, get confirmations on Log Book of the World. And this is a very expensive expedition where every team member is putting something like $20,000 of his own money into it. How can you be so mean? And if you don't like it, don't work them. Uh, I tend to uh, agree with that point of view. <laughs> um, anyway, let's talk a little bit about uh, the expeditions and particularly CDXC and, and how we decide uh, what amount to give uh, and so on. Well, we look at rarity, um, generally in the top 75 most wanted or for IOTA um, where fewer than 20% have worked it and, and the card on the right is Cesar V3LYC who operated last year from a newly designated island group in French Polynesia so he was indeed the first uh, to operate from there so everybody needed it. Uh, we look at difficulty, accessibility um, from a geographical point of view, from a political point of view and so on and we look at team competence you know, do, what experience do they have? How many big expeditions have they done? Can they pull it off, do we think? And although they can't budget accurately, although they can't accurately predict how many QSOs they're going to make, we do ask them to have a stab at those things. What do we ask in return? Well, we have a number of conditions and I've taken the, the thing on the right from our website and I'm not asking you to read it, um, but we don't believe that they're, they're onerous. We, we ask them to include CDXE as a sponsor on any website and on their QSL cards. Uh, we ask them to abide by the de-expeditionist code of conduct. Well, that's not unreasonable, is it? Uh, we encourage them to upload to Club Log, um, but why not? Uh, we knowledge we ask them to reply efficiently and speedily to QSL cards but we also ask them to upload a full log of the expedition to LOTW within six months. Now the Bouvet people have said 12 months and we're not going to argue with that we're not happy about it but the Northern Cal DX Foundation is divvying up a hundred thousand dollars for them and they're happy with 12 months. So we don't really have a lot of room for maneuver if we want to, uh, to be a part of that operation. Um, and perhaps uh, quite important is to provide a write-up in English for our magazine, because uh, you know, that's one of the reasons our members like the magazine is that we have write-ups of these expeditions and, and they can sit back in, uh, in the comfort of the shack after it happens and, uh, and read all about it. But how do we know what is rare? Well, the answer to that is very simple these days. We use Club Log. Because Club Log has 752 million QSO records and, and rising. Uh, and the data can be cut in many different ways by band, by mode, by country, by area of the world, etc. So most expeditions or would-be expeditions these days do their analysis beforehand on Club Log to figure out which bands they need to focus on, which modes they need to focus on, which areas of the world they need to focus on. And, uh, you know, it's just, as I said earlier, a, a very, very good tool. So, um, DX foundations generally, you know, there are many of them, as you can see, here's a slide of the sponsors of the, I think it was VP8PJ, and there's a lot of them. Uh, you'll see that there are actually three, um, well, the big ones internationally, by the way, uh, uh, Northern Cal DX Foundation, Indexa, uh, two big American ones, and one of the big advantages in America is if you donate to a DX foundation, um, they can pick up the, the tax as well. Uh, they, they're charitable, in other words, as, as would be the case if you were giving money to the National Trust in the UK, for example, but not to CDXC, unfortunately. Um, the German DX Foundation is quite a big one, but as I said earlier, we are the biggest in, in Europe. And indeed, there are three in the UK who sponsor expeditions. There's the RSGB, uh, who have a, a de-expedition fund which raises money from a number of sources, for example the raffle at the uh, the annual HF convention. 
Uh, there's ourselves and there's GMDX, the Scottish DX Club, much smaller, but we do all coordinate. So between us, um, if there's a major expedition, we, we can actually make quite a substantial donation and, and make a big difference. So there you have it. Um, there's the, the links, by the way, to our website and to our Facebook and to our Twitter. But that's all I have to say. Um, I'd throw it open. I'd be very, very happy to take questions. Oh, great, great stuff there, uh, Don. Um, and um, really, I, I could listen to people on uh, the expeditions for for ours and um, ours, you know, and uh, it, it, it's great to listen to how this whole thing works. And it's great that actually so many amateurs um, have been able to achieve their day expedition through the work of uh, CDX, EC and everything else. So, but anyone, um, if, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, um, you should be able to uh, unmute yourself there and ask any questions that you may have for Don. Yeah, I'd like to ask one if I may. Thank you very much for a lovely, uh, lovely speech, uh, lecture rather. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, how do you get on with sorting out customs for all your equipment and everything? <laughs> yes. Well, given that we work on such a large scale, um, other than uh, when we had to hand carry that, that lot for the last one, we've normally used a shipping agent to ship the container. And the container is officially sealed in the UK and officially opened at the other end. Uh, and the agent handles all the paperwork and that, to be honest, just makes life so straightforward. Um, now that last one was a bit different and, uh, you know, we had to kind of wing it, but um, because we were hand carrying everything, I think, uh, you know, people accepted that it was our personal, uh, personal kit, albeit rather a lot of it. But yeah, so, you know, prior, prior to that, we do shipping agents and it just makes life so much easier. I remember putting things back in the container uh, after 3B7 and um, we left a few things behind for, for the locals as a, by way of a thank you. So we didn't quite want the customs people taking too much of an interest. So Neville chatted to them while I supervised uh, a couple of lads who were moving things off the boat into the container and uh, it all went swimmingly. Uh, all right, thank you. George, we're not hearing no audio from you. You can always type a question. Same language. <laughs> yeah. Don, where, where's next? Is there any that you would love to visit yourself that you haven't been to yet? <clears throat> oh, the, the, there's lots. Um, I, I have activated a mere 56 DXCC countries over the years. I, I've got a long way to go. Oh, just 56, as just if. 56, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, in Northern Ireland, um, for me and maybe some other amateurs, DX is uh, also classed as a SOTA. You know, so to, <laughs> to, go, to go up uh, to say you've been to 56 other different uh, uh, locations, well, fantastic, absolutely well done. I have to say I've never operated from GI. I have operated from EI. <laughs> well, and, 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 and hold on, why is that? You're, you're more than welcome anytime. We're Absolutely. Here, here, here's your invite. And I have been to GI, but it's usually been on business or, or indeed to an RSGB AGM in Belfast. But uh, yeah. Mr. Thomas, I believe, has never operated from Northern Ireland either, and he's been offered uh, an invite every year. So maybe <laughs> you just could organize some. That's true. I, I just keep my head down, Philip. You know that. I've got a question. I've got a question for Don, if I can. Go ahead, Steve. Um, 
Don, what's your what's your favourite place you've been to? Is it is it always the biggest and the best de expedition, or is there something else about some places? I was just just wanted to pick your brains on what what does it for you about the location? Oh uh, yeah, that's an interesting one, Steve. I, I, it probably isn't any awesome. of the five star ones. It, it's probably some of the voodoo ones I've done in West Africa because it's just so different, and, mm. and there's a whole atmosphere of going to West Africa. And because we were a, a relatively small number of people, we couldn't do everything ourselves. So we had to enlist the help of, of locals to, to put up antennas and so on. And so you got involved more with the local people. We moved our equipment on every two years on a bus. So it was really quite exciting. We, we saw something of the country and, and we had some great times. And, and I've just been remi just reminding myself when we were in Ghana of my first trip um, with the voodoos, uh, a couple of anecdotes, if I may, very quickly. Um, Roger SXW had arranged for us to be interviewed by a local radio station. And um, uh, we got there and we did the interview and, and it went swimmingly. And the rest of the team back at the hotel were, were listening on, uh, on their portable radio. And then right at the end, they said, that's fine, but wh which of your equipment are you leaving for us? <laughs> <laughs> because they, you know, it was all kind of egg boxes for their uh, to, to deal with the acoustics and some very old equipment. Uh, I had to uh, quickly think of something and said, "Well, this is all single sideband. It's no use to you at all." <laughs> um, and there was also, um, I was going to say, uh, "Oh, what was the? Oh, yes, that you know, we were putting antennas up there, and uh, there was a, one of the locals was helping us, and we realised he seemed to know more about it than we did." And it turned out he'd been in the, the Ghanaian Merchant Marine as a, as a radio operator and uh, then had to, um, to retire back to Ghana to look after his daughter when his wife died. But uh, he seemed to know more about coax and radios than we do. Oh, there's, there's radio amateurs everywhere. They just come out of the woodwork, <laughs> don't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Terry, G3 VFC, good evening. Hi, um, hi, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you, John. And uh, it just inspires me and makes me wish to goodness that we could have another uh, HF convention. I hear things like this from year to year to year. And uh, this was an HF convention in miniature. Well done. Well, I hope we can have an HF convention, Steve. <laughs> hi, hey, <I>, Steve. <laughs> I put the pressure on Steve. Yep. Come on, we're all jabbed. We're all yep. good to go. John, can I ask a wee question? It's Eric, GI0MSI. Hello, Eric. Um, Easter Island, is that the same Easter Island with the statues on it? Uh, Easter Island is, yes, yes but not Christmas is. Island. <laughs> um, Sorry, maybe I got that mixed up wrong. Or, we went no. to Christmas Island. So there's Easter and there's Christmas and there's probably everything else in between. And some of my colleagues have been to Easter Island, but I never have. But it is the one with a uh, statue. No, the, the, the Christmas Island we went to in the middle of the Pacific is where all the um, nuclear tests took place in the 50s. And I should have mentioned that the Captain Cook Hotel that we stayed at was actually the officers' quarters for, for that to those tests and funnily enough after I got back I discovered that two members of the Reading Club which I belonged to at the time had actually been on Christmas Island for those tests um, doing their national service so that was quite a coincidence. Uh, sorry I got I got the thing mixed up there. No problem at all. Was there, was there a would there have been much radiation from that time or? Oh there was and the, the British government paid the New Zealanders to clean up the island and uh, it's apparently got la the least background radiation of anywhere in the world now because they did such a good job. Of course, they were very happy to take British government money to do that. But there's now a, there was a rather curious building just down from the hotel we were staying in with, with uh, what looked like antennas, but were obviously sensors. And um, they are continuously monitoring radiation just to make sure that, that nothing else escapes. Well, if you're ever going back, uh, Don, I know a man that can lend you a personalized gig account or whatever they're called. Excellent. George, do you want to try now? Yeah, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Work away. Yeah. 
Now the other microphone wasn't working for some reason. Don, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting uh, talk and uh, uh, really useful to get the word out about DX uh, or CDXC. Sorry, um, it, it's something the Camaras Islands the expedition um, was the the first one where I actually went chasing and got you. The, the band conditions were wonderful. I think I got you on six six bands, uh, including the uh, the work bands on on SSB and CW. And at at that stage, I was ready to pack the hobby in, and it uh, changed me around and, and got me back in HF and and kicked off my the HFDXing properly and uh, uh, the setup. I think I I think he's did it. Was it it? He's did the video for. I do remember buying one of the videos. Yeah, uh, it may well have been. I can't. Yeah. remember. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, that's a lovely story, and I, you know, I love it. I'm great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, incidentally, I came back after two weeks of that expedition. I was only there for the first two weeks, and I uh, I came back. Oh, that was the next one. Yeah, three yep. weeks, seven. Yeah. Yeah, some brown. Um, I came back after two weeks uh, and I traveled back with Mike G3SED and we, we competed to see who would be first on the air and work the expedition after we got home. So I got home and my wife said, in the bath, clean up. I said, no, no, I've got to work them. And, and I went into the shack and I worked them and then I realized that I'd wound all my antennas down before I set off and they were all lying on the house roof and yet I still worked them without any trouble at all and I beat Mike which was the important thing. Yeah what really convinced it for me was the fact I was doing it with 100 watts yeah. a basic HF rig and uh, it was either dipoles or a cobweb antenna ah. and I was amazed that I was able to get these on so many bands. On 10 meters I remember we worked an American in California who was bicycle mobile it was just awesome, <laughs> which was great. Okay. Okay. Uh, Anyone, uh, any last final questions here before yeah. we wrap up? Yeah, from Terry, VFC again. Um, how do you uh, suffer or do you not suffer um, being a multi-station multi environment? What tests? Uh, do you do on the kits before you go and when you get there um, are you satisfied that those tests were good and uh, are, you satisfied, <laughs> are you satisfied with the kit that you took or uh, oh you... that's a leading question um we we take g0 opb with us or g2 nf as he now is and he spends most of his time on the island chasing problems with interactions between the stations um, yes, we we put low pass filters between all the rigs and the amplifiers. That's one of the reasons we decided to have dedicated um, stations per band after Spratly, because on Spratly we did that, and uh, we used to quite regularly change bands and forget to change the filters and blow them up. So Tony spends a lot of time replacing capacitors in the filters. Uh, we also have high powered um, high pass filters on the outputs. We run the coaxes as far apart as possible. Um, and we still get some interactions and uh, some of the early uh, radios that we took, I have to say, were a little bit um, dirty, shall we say, on the transmit side. Uh, the other challenge we set ourselves later was to be able to run more than one station on a band. And that meant having narrow filters so we could run on, for example, 80 sideband and 80 CW simultaneously. And Tony made some very, very sharp bandpass filters, um, unique, uh, you know, he built them. And I say very sharp, I mean, there was only a few kilohertz in which we could transmit, um, but then, you know, we could decide where we wanted to transmit and everybody who was chasing us had to fit in. But so we did some clever stuff, yeah, and, uh, but it's always a challenge and, and you always get problems once you arrive. Well done, thank you. FGI zero LM again. Um, uh, you were talking about you had locals uh, very often helping you and whatever. Did you ever cause them QRM? When I say locals, I'm not talking about local amateurs. I'm talking about 
local helpers. So these are just, you know, guys either working for the hotel or or, um, or just fishermen or whatever, and, and you pay them a few dollars a day and they'll do anything for you. Um, yeah, <laughs> though funnily enough, on 3B7, uh, the, the fishermen had a, a radio that they listened to all day when they weren't out in their boats. And we caused all sorts of problems to that. And they didn't even seem to notice. <laughs> they just listened to whatever noise was coming out of it. And on the Comoros, incidentally, uh, there was a local radio station. And by that, I mean a broadcasting station that, that we made some contact with. And we left a whole lot of coax and stuff for them afterwards because... You know, they really did not have a lot of resources. Thank you. Okay, folks, if there's no final burning questions. Uh, no, I don't see I, any hands. Go, just go ahead. Uh, Terry mentioned you causing QRM to locals, whatever that may be. Did you ever experience much QRM on any of the, the expeditions or? Interference oh. problems to the stations. Sorry, are you talking about local noise or are you talking yes. about deliberate QRM or, or what? No, 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 local noise and whatnot. No, I'm they, sure you didn't have VDSL issues and whatnot. No, no. Had you any other issues like that? <laughs> you, you do have some problems because uh, I have to say, you know, the power distribution systems and so on can leave a bit to be desired in some of these places. But uh, no, fortunately, um, you know, we are. are locations have been sufficiently remote that, that we've had no problems at all and uh, I'm delighted to say because you're right I mean it could be a disaster but one of the things we have done is is we've got the resources to send one or two people out beforehand on each of these expeditions to do a, a recce um, Don, Don Beatty uh, went out to the Comoros beforehand um, I can't remember what happened with Rod Riggs, but uh, with St. Um, Brandon, Don and Neville went out to the island and then Don and I uh, made a subsequent trip to uh, to sort out all the licensing and the permissions and everything. So you know, if you have the resources, if you're a big enough team and so on, then you can afford to, to do that kind of analysis beforehand and make sure there's no surprises. Great stuff. Okay, uh, Don. Can I just uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening and uh, giving us one of our other Tuesday night lectures. Uh, it is much appreciated. We find it really interesting to hear these different stories of uh, people's day expeditions and everything else. So again, from all of us, thank you very much. And uh, you can catch this on, on our YouTube channel in a couple of days time. Uh, and uh, much appreciated. Thank you again.